fact that the guys who are singing were out busy in the preaching in the middle of everything today. First Corinthians 15, I will be brief tonight, and uh, we will, I don't know what brief means, but I won't be as long as I could be, um, but uh, just for a few minutes tonight, uh, let me give you just three or four quick reasons why we do what we do. Why we do what we do. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll look at a couple of verses. If you wouldn't mind having your phone off, and I will uh, hurry, and we'll get through quicker than normal. And again, thank you, thank you. Um, how many of you had a good time today? You know, you go, you get out doing this, you realize, you know what? This is fun. It's a fun thing. And um, any, anybody who led your first soul to Christ today? Anybody like that? Had your first convert today? I know we had lots of people saved today, but I don't know if we had, had any, I, I had not heard any first convert stories, but what a great thing to be a part of all this. Every turkey that was bought, every bag of groceries, every hot dog, all of this, uh, it is what our church is all about. If anybody asks, what's the difference in churches? The purpose of our church out of Ephesians 4 is to perfect the saints for the work of ministry. Our goal is to help everybody know how to do the work God wants done. That's our goal. Uh, it's not an entertainment ministry. We're not trying to big, build a big crowd so we can all sit back and listen to cool music. It's not, not what we're about. Uh, we got good music here. But we're about training people to do the work of God. And there's, that's another sermon. But look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's stand for just a moment. If your knees will work. If they won't work, stay sitting down. I already said I'm not going up and down these stairs on a big day, up and down, up and down. You can forget that. I'm a first floor man. <clears throat> my head will go anywhere. It's my knees that don't cooperate. 1 Corinthians 15, if you would look down, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain out of this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due season. He defines the gospel in those first couple of verses, in verse 3, that he died, in verse 4, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That's the gospel. The good news, that he died, that he's buried, that he rose again for you. That is good news. Let's pray. Father, help us this evening. Teach us tonight. And uh, thank you again for the great day. Thank you for all the work and, and people that stepped out of their comfort zone to try and do what you would have us do for a lost world. Help us. And may each year more and more people gather themselves together and, and just say, I'm going to be a part of helping people. For eternity in Jesus name we ask it amen you can be seated <clears throat> why do we embrace these ideals why the sacrificial path that we travel why the faith why, why have a faith that is outside the mainstream uh, many times we've gone out to preach and we found somebody giving away food or giving away coffee and donuts or whatever and they're doing it to be nice and they're doing it in Jesus name they're just not introducing anybody to Jesus and they're not bad people but they're missing it um, they're they're missing it and we've many times had our folks come say can I just share a word with the crowd about Jesus while you're feeding them absolutely and and we'll preach and people will get saved uh, why 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 are we outside what might be considered the mainstream of religious people in America. Why do we embrace something that causes us to step out of ourselves? Why, you know, at a church like this, why is it the, the vacations, the extra cars, the unusual things we could have done with money, why does it go into things, not just our, our basic building and properties, but the extra things we do? I'm going to give you several reasons why we do what we do. Number one, because Christ died. He did not just live a good life. He died. He died. He died. So what? He died so I goof off? He died so I do nothing? He died so that I could kick back? 
Is that why he died? I'm following one who died. <coughs> he died to himself. He left heaven. He left, excuse me, he left all the comforts. He left ease. He left praise. He left worship. He left esteem. He died. He died. Why do we do what we do? Because we're following someone who died. I think, well, you know, this is inconvenient. You're following someone who died. <clears throat> he did not inconvenience himself. He died. He didn't just live a good life. I don't follow a good God. <clears throat> I follow someone who died. And yes, he's good, but he died. I don't follow a wealthy Middle Eastern landowner who wants a bunch of people to bow at his feet. I follow someone who chose to be without house and family and no pillow to lay his head sleep in the hills and wander the streets without friend and to die with no one to care number one we do what we do because he died he died to give us a free gift paid for with his own blood and can we not at least give of ourselves that someone else could have that same free gift. If he would ask us to die, we should do it willingly, but most of us will never risk our lives for Christ's sake. But we could give a day, we could give a dollar, we could give talents, we could give time. Why do we embrace these ideas? Why would we walk a sacrificial path? Why would we have a faith that causes us to be a little bit weird? <clears throat> Number one, because he died. Secondly, because the lifestyle of this world stinks. Go out in that world and you'll find broken dreams, <clears throat> broken hearts, broken lives, broken morals, ruined dreams. I mean, just look, between Hollywood and politics and athletes, you've got people who've soiled their morals, ruined themselves financially, destroyed their children, or they don't have any children, broken marriages, broken dreams, countless hours of suffering, lawsuits, divorces that cost millions of dollars, and they're not happy, and they will not be happily ever after. Why do we do what we do? Number one, because he died <clears throat> that we could live. Number two, because there's nothing out there any better. <clears throat> what you get as a child of God is 10,000 times better than what that world has to offer. There is no hope in cancer when you're out in the world. There's no peace at a funeral without Jesus. There is no hope when you face bankruptcy. Now understand, we're in this world and we may suffer financial or health or some kind of a natural disaster we may have a hurricane, a tornado, an earthquake. We may have disease or famine. We may have a business shut down. Those things are all, but look, that's because we live in a sin-cursed world. But when all that happens, the child of God, if I can use this mic, the child of God's over here and we've got hope. But if you don't have Christ, you don't have any hope. Why do we do what we do? Why do we march to a different beat? Why do we go out and push ourselves and put in the extra hours and put in the extra time and, and, uh, and like Tad says, relax. I felt the same way this weekend. I thought, you know what? God, just whatever you want to do. We're just going to go out and we've gathered a bunch of, we spent a bunch of money on food and turkeys. And by the way, <clears throat> most of you know this, but the folks who are out in the middle of it, a lot more money came out of wallets today than ever came into an offering plate in here. Just a fact. It's like these, you go to the Philippines with me, someone says, how much money should I bring along? I said, you won't bring enough. You won't. You'll pay your $1,600 or, you know, you college kids are trying to pay most of our college students away as we can. And you get over there and you'll be so humbled. You'll be, you'll be writing bad checks. Trying to, you, I'll be preaching at a meeting. And, and meet, meet a pastor and his wife and three teenagers. How'd you get here? Well, we took a boat, <clears throat> took a day across from our island to this island, and then we rode for eight hours on a bus, and then we walked for four hours to hear me. 
and I asked the host pastor, isn't there any easier way for them to get here? Yeah, but they don't have any money. I'm thinking, all right. <laughs> well, your wallet starts coming out, and, you, and today there was money spent yesterday and today. And Why do we do that? We do it because, number one, Christ died. You young people that are planning your life, be very careful that you don't plan a life all about you. <laughs> no, if, if God leads you to be an engineer or a, or a carpenter or a, a computer work of some kind, <clears throat> that's fine. But don't build it around you. I, wanna, I just want to make something of myself. Jesus already made something of you. He made you a child of the king. You can't improve on that. If you're saved, you already are the best thing you could ever be. All you need is a way to make a living while you live for the one who died. All you need to do is serve your fellow man and he might put you in law enforcement or he might put you in construction work or he might put you in the ministry. But it's not about that. Look, you just need a way to pay the bills so you can love God and so you can love people. We're not here to pile up pictures of presidents. We're here to pile up the souls of men for an eternal God who gave his only begotten son to die for their sins. Why do we do what we do? Number one, because he died. How could I do less? Because he died. Secondly, because this world's got nothing. To, what else are you going to do? <clears throat> oh, I'm going to go out and be famous. Oh, yeah. Go, go be a Kobe Bryant whose life is over at 35. Do you know my career has lasted longer than Michael Jackson's? You say, someone might say, well, he made more money. Mm -mm. I haven't even begun to get my paychecks yet. <laughs> you wait till I'm walking on Golden Streets 10,000 years. Understand this. That world has nothing to offer you. When we go to the hospital and we bow our heads to pray over some dear saint of God, like Mrs. Lopez, who had that surgery last week and week and a half ago, and cancer and her liver, and then the wondering of biopsies and all those happening, and, and knowing that he does all things well. You see, and, and if you weren't here this morning, uh, Mr. Lopez is here, all the tests and all the scans come back and there's no cancer. They don't, they're not even, not even going to do any chemo or radiation or anything. But, you see, as a child of God, if all the reports were on earth terms bad, it's still good. But when you're out in the world, there are no good reports. Well, we're going to be fine. No, you're not. You're going to die. Their marriages stink. They don't know how to raise a child. People out in the world without Christ don't even know how to get a two-year-old to sit still. I never... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and I remember somebody coming over to our house. We had a picnic. We had a... <laughs> we had a picnic at our house. About, I don't know, 100 people at our house. I was sitting with one of my kids in this little block wall. We had two-year-old, three-year-old sitting there. And uh, I walked away, and I said to, to whoever it was, I said, sit here and wait for me. And, and I went and did whatever and came back a little bit later, three hours later, no, not long. <clears throat> and uh, a newer person in our, in our church said, this is my church. I said, what? He said, this is my church. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've decided this is where I'm going to go to church from now. And I said, why? He said, because you've got a kid that will listen. And I said, oh, we've got a raft of them at church. Yeah. Those who didn't listen are in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> when you got little boys and girls that can take out a gospel track and explain to somebody how to go to heaven look the world the world can't give you a child like that and you broken i love sharon o'brien you know broken life broken heart broken everything alcoholism and all the mess and she gets saved and her husband gets saved and they get involved here. Sharon's, Sharon has led more people to Christ than most preachers that have ever lived on the face of the earth. And, and whatever you want to say, you know what's great in the world if your life's been broken in the past, it's broken. But Jesus makes all things new. 
and he picks up the broken pieces and he rebuilds the broken lives and he gives hope to the hopeless and dreams to those who didn't think there could be another dream and he takes those who shamed the name of Christ and shamed their own name and picks them up and does something wonderful with them you can't get that without Jesus why do we do what we do number one because he died number two because this world gives you no hope <clears throat> number three because life's short life is very short some of us have turned 60 and become elderly. <laughs> I used to like Micah. How did, how did 60 get here? By the way, I'll challenge you any day to a knockdown drag out game of tic-tac-toe or checkers. <laughs> I'll thumb wrestle with you, man. <clears throat> How does, six, how does 70 get there? You know, your, your head says, oh, you can do that, and your body says, right. <laughs> Life's short. The muscles go, the wrinkles come. The hair starts growing everywhere it shouldn't, stops growing everywhere it should. <laughs> you know, when you go to the barber and he wants to trim your ears and your nose, <laughs> Age, age, that's disgusting, isn't it? I just say, he looks, just cut my hair. Stay out of my personal life. <laughs> hey, it's not very long before your conversations with friends and relatives, 90% is about what medication you're taking. Life is short. Life is short. What a dumb thing to live for this world. Life is short. will soon be past, and only what's done for Christ will last. Romans 8, 17 says, And if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Do you understand? Life is short, and the inheritance awaits the child of God. And I'm excited. One of the greatest things to me about a day like this and seeing people out there busy, and I think of people like Ray and Audrey Fossey up in heaven. We met them. Ray was unsaved. Audrey was saved and out of church and spent the last decade of their life or 15 years of their life serving and investing. And they're in heaven today. And what a difference it made. And somebody wrote a letter to a widow and said, We're praying for you. We're so sorry about your loss of your husband. And one of our men took that address and went over and dropped the book off on heaven. And she got the assurance of her salvation. And then she bumps into Ray in a parking lot, brings him here. And Ray gets saved at the altar call. And the two begin to serve God. And I think of the hundreds of people in our church who are in heaven right now who've served and given and invested. And life is short. Their life didn't end. It just began. Ephesians 3, 6 says that the Gentiles, that's you and me, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers with the promise in Christ by the gospel. You are an heir, a joint heir. Titus 3, 7, being justified by his grace that we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. An heir. An heir out in the world, you pile some money up and then you lose it. You pile it up. And everybody's worried about the stock market going up and down, up and down. I don't worry about the stock market because I don't have any stock. I'm only worried about whether there's milk in the fridge and cookies in the cookie jar. Because I got that. You know what? The inheritance that we have in heaven, that's forever. The stock market and glory never goes down. It only goes up. And every, every bit of good you do for God and for people, it just stacks up and stacks up. And I love, I'm, in my heart, I think about the judgment seat of Christ thinking, I can hardly wait to see the men and women and the young people that grew up here and invested their lives in Christ and look around and think, I love that we got to do it together. I mean, you talk about lottery winners. You're in already. Number one, why do we do what we do? Because Jesus died. That's who we're following. Number two, because life 
And this world's got nothing at all to offer you. Number three, because life is so short. And four, because the trouble I face as a child of God brings rewards. Now let me explain. <clears throat> Here's an unsaved man or a Christian that's just away from God and out of church. They have trouble. You know what it is? It's trouble. You have, <clears throat> you have trouble and you cling to Christ. You ask him for grace to bear the burdens and face the difficulties. In the Bible, I don't have time to turn to it, but the Bible promises all kinds of rewards for those who suffer in the faith. And you carry burdens and you hang on to the Lord and you hurt and you hang on to him and you try to be a good testimony in your sorrow and in your difficulty and you try to be faithful to God in your hours of darkness and, and uh, when you doubt, you, you confess it and you long to stay near to him. And over here, same burdens in the world. Their burdens have no reward. Their burdens have no value. They just, have, they just suffer for no reason because the world's a miserable place. But see, you get paid for your suffering. Every burden, every heartache, God promises that as we faithfully bear the thorn in the flesh, as Paul called it, as we suffer, you drive the long hours, you get involved in ministry, you do the things you do. God, every hardship, every hardship that you carry, God will reward you for them. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow them, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. You understand, there's a process. Once you get saved, that he's, he's going to justify you and he's going to glorify you. And your eternal glory is a springboard off of your faithfulness to Christ today. And that Christian who's saved but lives a complacent life, they're going to be in heaven. But it's not going to be the same for them. Just like living on earth isn't the same. Number one, because Christ died, we do what we do. We do, some, we do crazy things. We live a lifestyle different from the world. Because life is short. Because there's rewards for doing right. Lastly, and most of all, because Jesus deserves our best. He does not deserve the leftovers. Can you imagine Thanksgiving coming? You got relatives from out of town coming to the house, family and folks that you love, and they come to visit. And they show up, and comes dinner time, and the wife goes to the kitchen, opens the fridge, and looks in the cupboard, says, Well, I wonder what's left over we could have for dinner for Thanksgiving. Probably it's not going to happen. In the average mom or grandma's house, if there's family coming for Thanksgiving, they're preparing days ahead of time. And they're going to prepare their best. I think Jesus deserves our best. I mean, tonight after church, some of you might go home and eat whatever you can find in the fridge. At our house, after church, is sit around and talk and everybody do your own thing for food. But Jesus deserves our best. And I guess you could throw in with that, this world's not my home, I'm just passing through. Only here just for a little while. So we run our race, we empty our bank accounts, we use up our free time, we give money that we could have saved, we give extra money to missions, and we give extra money to the building fund, and then the preacher wants to help pay some college kids ways to the Philippines. And as soon as that's done, I want you to put up a new building. Because the fact is, Christ died. And this world will do nothing but hurt you. And life is short. And every bit of trouble we face for God will be rewarded for. And Jesus deserves our very best. Let's keep it up. Let's be faithful. Like Brittany said, uh, some of you have been doing this for 30, 35 years. Let's keep doing another 35 years because he's worthy. Let's pray. Father, bless our night. You've let us be a part of your work for the last 36 hours, and we're grateful. Thank you that we could be a part of the greatest thing in the history of humanity, giving people the eternal good news, so that in a moment of time, a lost person could go from condemned to accepted in the beloved. 
Thank you. We get to be a part of it. And even those who didn't believe, they heard, and we did what you've told us to do. Would you help our church stay fresh? Help us to stay busy. Help us to hold loosely to the things of this world, but cling tightly to the things that are eternal. May our children grow up seeing an eternal perspective on life, because this world is not our home. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together just for a brief invitation.